better feeling for any filmmaker than to have a crowd like this. So I, I really appreciate it. Mm -hmm. So now you have to tell us how it all began. Uh, you mentioned the labor of love. So at what point did you first learn of this story? Uh, well, like probably 99.9% .9 of you all, I love Sunset Boulevard. <laughs> and there was a book that came out a few years back called Close Up on Sunset Boulevard. It was a making of the movie. And there was one chapter in the book about this musical, and I had never heard about this. And um, one of the people that was interviewed for the book was Alan Eichler, who was in the audience here somewhere, who was friends with Dixon Hughes. And he was the producer of the Swans and on Sunset uh, show. And I took uh, Alan out to, to breakfast, and he said, I've been waiting for 25 years for somebody to ask me about this. <laughs> and that sort of led one thing after another to uncovering other people who would, um, like Stephen Bach, the music publisher, who had that interview with Richard Stapley. That was like a miracle that that existed. And then we found the interview with Dixon, and then it started to um, become apparent that we had the materials to tell the story. And of course, Gloria Swanson saved everything from her entire career. Uh, and everything relating to the musical, even though she never talked about it in any interview or wrote about it, it's all there at the Harry Ransom Center, including all the audio tapes. So that's where it all sort of began. So how long was the process from inception of the idea to tonight? Uh, eight years, I think, pretty much. Wow. From that first um, lunch with, uh, with Alan, that was around the I Am Divine time. Wow. And, uh, you know, things just unfold in the pace that they unfold, so. Yeah, and it, it, the interesting element, you know, in the early parts of the film, we see clearly um, Zoom calls, which is something that we're seeing newly in documentaries <laughs> this year. So was, was the past year kind of a, a hindrance or a motivator in getting this finished? Well, uh, we were cutting all along, and then when COVID hit, there were just some, we had planned to go to the Harry Ransom Center and actually film there. So that whole uh, ending animation um, was really because we couldn't go. So we just had to find ways to tell the story in different ways and doing interviews on Zoom, that you're gonna be seeing a lot of that in documentaries that are coming out over the next festival, yes. few years. Um, but it, it seemed to work, and the idea of uh, appearing in the film, that wasn't really part of the plan initially. Uh, I was working with a friend of mine, Elijah Trenner, who was sort of helping come up with new ideas and ways to structure the film, and he suggested actually, why don't you put yourself in the movie and show the process of what it's like to make a documentary and how you find these kinds of materials, and I thought that was pretty cool, because I like seeing that kind of stuff. And archives are, you know, of course, Outfest has the Legacy Program and an incredible archive of LGBT film. I mean, we, we need to treasure our archives because how many more stories are there mm -hmm. sitting in boxes that haven't been told yet? I have this note card here and you're stealing all the things I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to bring up the Legacy Program mm -hmm. because I think it's, um, I mean, you've told um, a few stories about kind of queer history, especially in Hollywood, that, you know, doesn't get told for many decades. And I'm just, and I love that you kind of show the process of how that's uncovered. And I'm just wondering, like, are you looking for these stories more and more? Or are they finding you just by coincidence? It's just like a thunderbolt. It just happens, you know? Like, I happen to know Alan Eichler, and I happen to say, tell me a little bit about this. And then he just spilled the beans, and there was just so much to talk about. And, you know, Gloria, obviously, is somebody who was known around the world, but Richard and Dixon, are, nobody knows who these guys are. And when we started making the film and getting deeper into it, it became more and more about them. Like, the whole last two-thirds of the movie is really about them. And I had no expectation that that was going to be the case at, at the beginning, I, especially Richard, as we got deeper into it and talking about his struggles to remain relevant, much in the same way that Norma Desmond had her struggles and a little bit of delusion. Richard had the same thing. So the, the parallels to Sunset Boulevard were just so amazing that um, it just made sense to make it as a film. Yeah, I'm interested. It's just, it, the film's almost kind of three biographical tales in one. and. Um, Probably a very different process in, in excavating the information. I mean, Gloria Swanson, as you said, there's so much historical record. And let's start with her because it's it, there has been a lot written, especially by Gloria herself. And I'm just like, how do you approach getting a fresh perspective on her life um, in making up this film? Yeah, you know, I read the book and I was like, well, when is she going to talk about this musical? It seemed like it occupied so much of her mind. But she was, as, as one of our subjects says in the film, she led many lives. She had so much going on, even during this period that we're talking about. She was running businesses, and she was just this amazing, she, you know, she had a patent company, and she was bringing German scientists out of Germany during the war. It's like, what didn't this woman do? It was so incredible. Um, but talking to her granddaughter, Brooke, uh, who unfortunately couldn't be with us uh, tonight, but she sends her love, um, she, Brooke gave us a personal point of view on, on her grandmother. And so, you know, we wanted to show a side of Gloria that people really didn't know. 
because if they know her at all today, it's through the Norma Desmond character, and that is about as far as you can get from the real Gloria. And with Richard and Dixon, it's um, you know they came from an era where you know talking about two men in a relationship wasn't really publicly done, um, and, and it seems like even in some of the interview footage, they're still reluctant to even speak on it. And I'm just wondering if the people that you met that knew them like shared that reluctance, or if they were kind of at a point where they could talk. No, I mean at this point, the, the cat's out of the bag. <laughs> Everyone is comfortable talking about it, and also in a kind of a humorous way, about particularly about Richard. That at a certain point, it's like it's there's really nothing to hide anymore. And Richard did become more comfortable in his older years. He ultimately allowed Dixon to proceed with Swanson on Sunset, which did talk about their relationship. And so he, you know, he wasn't marching in, you know, on Santa Monica Boulevard in the Pride Parade, I'm sure. But you know, uh, Dixon, um, you know, had a very happy life in Palm Springs and. You know, was part of the gay scene both here in LA and in and Palm Springs. So, you know, they, they were just men of a different generation. I mean, when we, we did the Tab Hunter film a few years ago, it was a similar dynamic with Tab. Just, you could see him in that film just squirming, <laughs> just not wanting to talk about it, but he understands that we're living in a different time, that that res reticence to talk about their lives, because they had, out of safety, you know, they just, they, they couldn't talk about their lives because they could lose everything. I'm going to give the audience a chance to ask some questions here, so please raise your hands. Do you know?